elegant architecture and manicured gardens. An elaborate morning scene in the yard of St. Philip's Church. Biblical verse in a comprehensive family tree, surrounded by graceful vines and skillful embroidery. Worked between 1821 and 1830, this sophisticated Charleston sampler exhibits the wealth and eminence of the holy city and speaks to the cultivated skill, morality, and domestic priorities of a girl on the brink of womanhood. Yet the life of the maker, Marianne Colbord, does not reflect the pastoral scenes in grand homes stitched in silk. Wrought with parental loss, disability, and a broken family, Marianne's lived experience as an indigent daughter of antebellum Charleston presents a stark contrast to the typical makers of such fine needlework. Affluent girls who received the time and tutelage to craft a product that functioned as a gateway to a wider array of female accomplishments. However, a close examination of Marianne Sampler and the world of education in antebellum Charleston at large reveals a widespread network of learning, one accessible to all genders, social classes, and races, complicating the scope of Southern needlework and challenging the notions of educational agency in antebellum Charleston. Born in October of 1806, Marianne was the only child of Mariner William Colborne. However, Colboard soon disappears from the public record and is presumed dead early in Marianne's childhood. Her mother, also named Marianne, entered into the second of four marriages during her short lifetime. The second turned into a third when the elder Marianne met Mariner and Rigger John Gerfin, giving birth to a daughter out of wedlock in 1812. She finally married Gerfin at St. Philip's Church on Christmas 1815, days before the birth of their second daughter. This marriage marked a fresh start for young Mary Ann Colbord. At nine years old, she officially had a new stepfather who had been a steady presence for the past four years of her young life, and new siblings to play with in their home on Beedon's Alley. Despite operating a boarding house surrounded by taverns frequented by characters of the wharves three streets away, the Gerfins were together, and perhaps for the first time, Marianne had a semblance of stability. The alley itself had been a scene of much change as Charleston's golden age began to fade in the early 19th century. Once the chosen performance location of the eminent St. Cecilia's Chamber Music Society, it had become a dirty and poorly maintained back street, surrounded by establishments of ill repute. Eventually, John Gerfin moved his family out of the alley to 42 Pinckney Street, where Mary Ann may have been living when she began her sampler in 1820. The marriage was fruitful. Mrs. Gerfin produced three more sons between 1816 and 1819. However, on January 24, 1821, the unthinkable happened. John Gerfin died of drowning off of Chisholm's Wharf leaving behind a pregnant wife and a blended family of six. The loss is no doubt devastating for the Gerfin clan. At only 15, Marianne Colbord loses the third father figure in her short life, and the only one she likely remembered. This time, Marianne watched as her five half-siblings, ranging from one through nine, experienced the same feelings of trepidation at the prospect of navigating the world without their father. Most unfortunately, the death of John Gerfin left his wife alone with the difficult task of caring for Mary Eliza and Sarah Eleanor, who were both deaf and mute, conditions considered severe disabilities in antebellum American society. Once again, the upheaval of death and displacement, so familiar to Marianne from her earlier childhood, left her with an uncertain future. But this time, Marianne was no longer a child. She was standing on the precipice of womanhood and was cognizant of what was at stake. Yet despite the disintegration of the stable life she had enjoyed, and perhaps in spite of it, Marianne clearly refused to let John Gerfin's death threaten her ambition. She found a way to focus her doubts and weave control of her future directly into the fabric of her linen sampler, one stitch at a time. An amalgamation of trends exhibited in antebellum needlework the iconography and layout of Marianne's sampler is varied and complex. 
Comprised of four distinct sections, the work is simultaneously an architectural, mourning, and family record sampler. The piece is worked in two-ply silk thread on a linen ground, and the sections are surrounded by an undulating vine with bicolored strawberries, a border often seen in southern antebellum needlework. The top section features an imposing five-bay house with a hipped roof. Worked primarily in cross-stitch, Marianne includes details of a shingled roof, brick steps, and chimneys outset from the house. Most notably, the building stands on piers, a hallmark of vernacular low country architecture that provided much needed ventilation and protection from coastal flooding. Marianne flanked her silken house with pairs of manicured topiaries reminiscent of Italian cypress, which stand in contrast to the wild floral vines that threaten to escape from behind control of the fence. While many antebellum girls adorned their architectural samplers with familiar buildings such as their school or home, Marianne displayed not what she knew, but what she aspired to have comparable to standalone plantation dwellings found outside of the city, Marianne created, created a pastoral scene that stood in stark contrast to the cramped corners of the Beedon's Alley boarding house of her childhood. But where was Marianne exposed to such a building? Not urban Charleston, where most fine domestic buildings followed the single house plan, oriented sideways to the long and narrow lots. Visitors invited through the piazza door may have been privy to a frontal view of the house, but Mary Ann likely retained the limited perspective of an outsider. Separated by a geometric band, the second section features stanzas from two different religious hymns, each flanked by a pastoral farm scene. Featuring trees in different stages of flowering, Mary Ann pairs the female figure with a tree ripe with fruit, representing her own burgeoning womanhood. In between, in between the trees sit verse from religious hymn. On the left side, lines from a poem by John Newton. On the right, the penultimate verse of Loving Jesus, Meek and Mild, from the 1742 Hymns and Sacred Poems by Charles Wesley. These same lines appear on many girlhood embroideries across America and Britain. By stitching these words into her sampler, Marianne was aligning herself with the accomplished collective of educated young ladies who were using their embroideries as stepping stones towards a virtuous and respectable womanhood. Central to the third section is a detailed scene of mourning. Surrounding an elaborate chest tomb marked with the phrase, Departed Worth, stand six figures in dark mourning dress under the doleful branches of a weeping willow. In size and shape, the six figures likely represent Marianne and her family lamenting the loss of John Gerfin. The immediate right of the grave stands Mrs. Gerfin, sobbing into her hands. Stands Marianne, her smaller teenage figure, figure slim in contrast to that of her mother, who may have been pregnant or recently recovering from the June birth and death of baby Martha at the time the mourning scene was executed. Mary Ann stands nine-year-old Mary Eliza, who is a hair taller, six-year-old Sarah Eleanor, situated behind their mother. Sarah Eleanor is five-year-old James, John, and behind Mary Eliza the young William is in the arms of Mary Ann. Encased by the traditionally symbolic weeping willows, the mourning collective is flanked by a second Five Bay Georgian home on the left in St. Philip's Episcopal Church on the right. After the marriage of her mother to John Gerfin on Christmas 1815, the church played a more significant role in the life of Marianne and her siblings. On the 18th of October 1816, Marianne and her two younger sisters were baptized at St. Philip's. Later, it is where both of her marriages would ultimately take place. After his death in 1821, John Gerfin was buried in the stranger section of the church's cemetery, but the size of his gravestone is unlikely similar to the elaborate marker stitched by Marianne. In this sense, the chess tomb speaks to the extent of Marianne's aspirational lifestyle to not only better the material world in which she lived, but to alter how she and her family are portrayed after death. 
The fourth and final section of the sampler is a detailed family register, marking the birth, death, and marriage dates of Marianne and her close family. Replete with events that surpass the 1821 date of her sampler, it is apparent that Marianne used her needlework as a living document, allowing it to remain unfinished for the course of a decade. This examination of the stitching reveals that the comp completion of the sampler occurred in three or more parts, each carefully planned within the X in space and worked in totality. The largest portion is the first pictorial section of the sampler, Anne's initial 1821 indication of completion above, above St. Philip's Church. The second worked portion includes two-thirds of the family register, concluded with the death, the death of her mother in February 1823. The final worked part, indicated by a change of thread and shift in focus to the adult life of Marianne, begins with her marriage to grocer Warren Nickerson in 1822, includes the birth of their children, and ends with the advent of her second marriage to blacksmith Michael Arnault in 1830. While Marianne went on to have seven more children that do not appear in her needlework, the completion of the sampler at this point in her second marriage is representative of her ascension out of the circumstances of her birth. While the iconography of her sampler was ambitious, the completion of the sampler was an ambitious act in itself, and Mary Ann succeeded. She created an exquisite and complicated object, usually indicative of leisure time and funds for education, and then ultimately married into Charleston's prosperous craftsman community, allowing the sampler to last over the course of a decade kept the promise of upward mobility alive. Despite a lack of surviving needlework with the Charleston provenance, the, American of, the amount of advertising schools, academies, and tutors that offered the skill indicate that Charleston had a rich tradition of the craft on par with any American city in the early 19th century. A city in the United States, Charleston certainly possessed the clientele who sought tutelage in a range of female accomplishments, prompting northern itinerant embroidery artists, like Samuel Folwell, to make journeys down to the holy city. Yet unlike many northern cities and towns, Charleston did not develop a clear needlework tradition, typically established by a teacher or academy. However, Mary Ann's work does present a clear connection to a sampler worked in 1808 by Sarah Ann Wilcox, daughter of a ship chandler, 13 years before the completion of Mary Ann's first section. The similarities between the two include the same geometric banding, spatulate flowered vines. However, the most notable similarity is the house on piers an architectural feature appearing on no other known samplers from the area. This suggests an educational link between the two, both of whom were children of lesser means. Yet the search for a connection reveals a much more varied and diverse network of education in antebellum Charleston. Between 1807 and 1822, hundreds of schools, academies, or tutors for children served the city. Out of these, 118 advertised for the education of girls, catering to the popular market of female accomplishments, including fine needlework, drawing, music, and foreign language. Placed in spatial relation to Marianne's dwellings, it is clear that opportunities for female education were plentiful and widespread throughout the city. However, many of these tutors remain financially inaccessible for indigent youth such as Marianne Colbord. Yet surviving works by girls like Marianne and Sarah Wilcox suggest an educational offering that extend, extended well beyond the parlors of Charleston's most affluent young ladies. Where did Marianne learn her embroidery skills? She completed a mature sampler wrought with over seven different varieties of, of embroidery stitches, creating a more advanced product than most other surviving needlework of the Low Country. This is something that took hours of practice, guided by the instruction of a dedicated teacher. Like most cities, Charleston determined ways to deal with the more impoverished and fallen members of their society, yet the city developed a remarkably rich array of charities, 
the bulk exclusively catering to white Christians in an attempt to unite white Charleston. Many of these charities also held educational institutions, such as the German Friendly Society and the South Carolina Society. Other societies did not offer schooling, but raised funds for such purposes, such as the Ladies' Benevolent Society. But to further boost the accessibility of education for poor white children, the city of Charleston developed five free schools, which followed a Lancasterian style of schooling. Within this British pedagogical system, where older students teach the younger students, one of the last tasks is making a marking sampler. Could Marianne's sampler have been an advanced product of this new style of public schooling? Or did a benevolent society fund her admittance into a smaller tutoring program where she learned advanced stitches? Offering education for destitute white children was the Charleston Orphan House. In 1790, the Orphan House opened as the first public orphanage in the United States, admitting youths displaced by death or by finances. Soon after her stepfather's 1821 death, the Orphan House unfortunately became a familiar part of Marianne Colbord's world. In 1822, the 16-year-old Marianne began her quest for an independent and stable adult life, something she was repeatedly denied during childhood, and married grocer Warren Nickerson, moving up to the Charleston Neck. Her mother's fate was less fortunate, as she reappeared at the original Beedon's Alley residence in the 1822 directory. Mrs. Gerfin soon remarried a James Swift, the fourth marriage within 17 years, only to die the next February of 1823 at the age of 36. Marianne's five siblings became true orphans, putting the care of the young children and disabled sisters into question. Marianne took in William, but James and Robert were accepted to the orphan house in September. Efforts to get Mary Eliza and Sarah Eleanor, who remained in the Beedon's Alley property, into the orphan house were more difficult. In an 1829 letter to the director of the orphan house, Marianne pleads for their acceptance, but note her competent handwriting, another hallmark of a proficient education. As the eldest and potentially most educated member of the family, Marianne acted as a key advocate for her younger siblings. Ultimately, the sisters were accepted and were struggling to learn basic needlework before they were removed to a more appropriate institution in Philadelphia that catered to others with their conditions. Yet the sisters' early time at the Charleston Orphan House reveals the scope of education at the institution, basic reading and writing, but still supplemented by utilitarian needlework. The Charleston Orphan House and the network of charity education schools neglect the stories of Charleston's African-American population. While occasional fellowship societies did exist for the aid of orphan black children, the city directories reveal a different story in regards to their education, one that directly contradicts the 1740 statutes against the enslaved and free black population of South Carolina, which severely limited their actions and further dehumanized their lives. Between 1816 and 1822, schools specifically catering to black children appear along the myriad of listings for white ones. Charlestonians listed, listed, listed as free people of color, abbreviated as FPC in the directories, were even teachers themselves, banding together and helping build a free black population who could read and write, spreading personal agency and resistance in an extremely oppressive and racist society. It was this availability of education and communication that undoubtedly struck fear into white Charlestonians. In 1822, these fears were realized with the conspiracy of Denmark Vesey. And by 1825, the city directory, all mentions of education for the free black population, both schools and teachers, have been removed. Shortly after, the education of free blacks became explicitly illegal. But racist white education could, legislation could not erase the years of education fostered by the black population of Charleston. The agency of erudition was something that could not be taken away. While the sampler of Marianne Colbord primarily tells the story of an impoverished white woman and the ex unusually exquisite needlework that she was able to create despite her circumstances, it does not provide an explicit link to the enslaved or free black communities. 
Yet, living nearby and working alongside members of Charleston's free black population, the lived experience of the colborne Gervin family was very different than that of the white elite, sharing closer spatial and perhaps social associations with their African-American neighbors. But they shared more than this. My research into the world of education in antebellum Charleston revealed a network of learning more widespread than previously thought, one that included not only poor white teenagers like Marianne, but opportunities for the free black population. We don't yet know what these schools produce, but the expansion of education for free blacks leading up to the 1822 VC insurrection is clear. When put in conversation with Charleston's free schools and the work of the of benevolent societies, this racially diverse group of educational institutions and educators complicate our understanding of marginalized communities in early 19th century Charleston. Embodied by the survival of objects like Mary Ann Sampler, we can trace an emerging spirit of agency and personal jurisdiction that flourished, even for a brief time, within a deeply prejudiced low country society. Thank you.